we have Maxine Mitchell, who you'll probably hear me just refer to as Max throughout the conversation. But Maxine Mitchell reporting live from New York City. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? You good, sis? I am great. Good. You. Good, good, good. How's your life? It is a lot of things, you know. I'm here. I'm uptown in Harlem. Um, we're supposed to be getting more snow, so we'll see how that goes. But the ATVs are out. So okay. if you know about living uptown, you know the ATVs are usually out in the summertime, but we've been getting them even in the midst of snow. So Harlem will Harlem. Creepy. That's one yes. thing I know for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure, for sure. So for all of our listeners who aren't very familiar with you yet or are becoming familiar with you, um, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Why do you do it? Sure. So Maxine, as mentioned, um, I'm from New York, originally um, born and raised. My entire family, though, is from the island of Grenada. Um, so, you know, sad now with a pandemic that I'm not able to travel as much um, as I would like to to go home, but I definitely still have a lot of connections to the island. Um, in terms of what I do, uh, my full-time role is working directly um, as a professional and campus recruiting manager supporting solely candidates of color. So particularly focused on Black candidates, Latinx candidates, and uh, Native American candidates mm -hmm. uh, and students and professionals. So working with companies from startups all the way to, you know, enterprise level um, companies. So the big names that everyone knows, I am working with their recruiters, um, trying to get candidates of color into their interview processes. Um, and then on the side, I own my own career coaching business, again, solely focused on black and brown professionals. Um, so because of my love of, of working with undergrads, I love and enjoy, uh, you know, working with recent grads and early career professionals, but have done a lot of work with, with folks uh, with double my years of experience, uh, you know, folks who have worked in government and then decided to pivot and, and go into uh, the private sector, you know, folks who are making the opposite uh, switch. So I really, really, really love careers and am also passionate about um, access and, and representation in the workplace. So I get to do that uh, full time and I get to do that on the side. So excited about what I get to do. Yeah. So when I emailed you first about the podcast, I was like, wow, okay, Max, we could talk about recruiting. We could talk about cocktails. We could talk about uh, the islands. We could talk about reproductive health. There are so many things. Because also I feel like everything that you're familiar with, everything that's personal to you, you have a, a masterful understanding of, it seems like. You're really keen on like honing in why you care about this thing, why you know about this thing, why you love and why you can communicate about this thing. Uh, which is probably why we ended up meeting really on Twitter. I think in person first, but then I was like, oh yeah, okay, Twitter, yeah, no, no, no. Yes. Uh, so the conversation for today, we're going to focus on reproductive health, um, birth control conversations, sex life conversations, because what are those in the pandemic? Um, because I know recently, it, it has to be a couple of months ago at this point. Yes, it um, is. Surgery that was considered elective, I believe. Yep. Uh, so just for, for our listeners to understand a little bit about the decision you made and why you made it, what surgery did you have? And is this something that you sought out or something that you came across and was like, oh, no, this sounds like a fit for me? Like what attracted you to this particular procedure? Sure. So in October, so getting ready to near six months, which is crazy, um, I had both of my fallopian tubes, uh, tubes removed. So um, the surgery itself is called a bilateral salpingectomy. Um, and again, it's bilateral because both of the tubes are removed. Right. Um, so what most people would probably assume is that if you remove one tube, it's like, oh, 50% chance of pregnancy. And it's like, no, it's like 70 to 90% chance. So for me, I knew um, at this point for, for 10 years that I was not interested in becoming a mother. Um, and I had never used hormonal birth control besides, I, I think I used plan B like twice in my life. Right. So, um, and for me, it was a principal thing. I was like, I'm not even interested in that. So I don't even want to introduce right. hormones because right. I don't even want that. Right. So, um, you know, it took me, uh, not necessarily a while to make a decision, but I just recognized one, like folks weren't going to let me do it when I was 21 years old. Um, you know, there was a lot of guilt that I had to work through in terms of, you know, sharing this decision um, and, and making a final decision, uh, you know, with regards to my family. But for me, I've known, you know, for a really long time that I wasn't interested in bringing my own children into the world. Yeah. Um, love children. Um, 
you know, what's, what's funny, and I just mentioned this to someone uh, the other day, is like the last time that I thought about having a child was when my sister was born and my sister turned 30. Wow, okay. <laughs> last so, yeah. year. Okay, yeah. and when my sister when my sister was born, I was one <laughs> or right. almost two years old, right? So like- that Yeah, when you're up, I'm like, mm, this is cute, not for me. So not for me. have fun. <laughs> I was right. like, no, right. Like she was this my, is the last time I'm doing this by proxy. Cool. That's Great. it. Right. Like I am a two year old. This is fun. After that, not so much. Right. So right, I, right. I, I right. Wasn't. So the doll just, just actually does things. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Well, I like dolls, but for me, yeah. I was like not an actual baby. Right? Right, and, right. And a big piece of that was also like just me literally tapping into like the types of dreams that I was having with regards to children. And like in dreams, I thought of myself or saw myself mm -hmm. as an aunt or I saw myself ironically as a grandmother, which most people would think, well, oh, well, like, wouldn't you have to have a child? It's like, yes, but I'm thinking about myself as caring for a child that I did not bring into the world. Mm, so so mm -hmm. recognizing that piece was really important. And then, you know, I will spare that whole story unless we want to go into that. But like me in relationships, figuring out that um, pregnancy or birth of a child would have been, would have felt more like me giving a gift to someone yeah. than me feeling thoroughly excited um, yeah. about bringing a child into the world. And so last year, um, was obviously an insane year, but it also was an opportunity for all of us to be sitting down yeah. for most of us. And so it gave me the chance to be able to have the surgery and then rest without having, you know, to, to feel like I needed to take a bunch of time, even though I could have just with my job. Right. Um, so it was, it actually just worked out really well in, in terms of timing. Yeah. It sounds like it sounds like with with an elective surgery, of course, it's going to be highly emotional. Most surgeries are, but because mm -hmm. you're choosing um, this result, choosing this process, choosing this healing process, um, the emotions I, I would assume are, are a little bit different than a lot of other surgeries, emergency surgeries, preventative. This is preventative, but not in the same way. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, it is preventative, but not preventative. The same way. Thoroughly. But yes, I mean, Thoroughly. the emotions, yeah. the emotions were definitely there, but I think it was more of me coming to grips with the finality of my decision and the impact mm -hmm. that would have on my family right. versus the finality that it would have on, for me. Right. And so for me, this is, I mean, I haven't felt as young in my thirties as I feel right now, right? This was an opportunity for me to say like, wow, I did this at 31 at that point, right before I turned 32. Yeah. And now I'm like, I have my whole life, right? To be able entire to live life, it the way I right. want, like my entire life, right. right? And so for me, it was like, whoa, right? Then you realize like early thirties is like early thirties, right? Like you yeah. have a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's felt amazing, right? It's felt incredible. Um, you know, when I talk about this, I also talk about it with like a, a high level of, um, like sexual freedom for me, sexual compatibility and like having a really healthy sex life is important for me. And so I knew that like, I didn't want this to be part of that. And so I was able to make a decision where like, right. I don't have to think about that. Right. Or to spend your entire sex life, active sex life, guarding yourself against something that this activity naturally lends to, like to, yeah. to feel like you're on the defense while you're enjoying this exactly. very central part of your life. Exactly. I hear that. I hear yeah. that for real. Um, now, this is the part I don't know so much about from you. Um, I've heard you uh, bring it up in, in other conversations, but I can't wait to hear more about it right now. I want to hear more about like the actual day of surgery. So of course, like the procedural things, like the, the, how your hour by hour, your schedule went, but also like how you as a patient had to advocate for yourself. Like what battles did you have to fight for yourself? Was, was there anyone who stood up for you or who jumped in and, and said something when you maybe didn't have the words or the expertise or when you had to say it 3000 times and someone said it that 3000 first time, right. like what was that actual process in daylight? Sure. So I can, I can walk you through the full process. I was very fortunate in that um, my sister works for a reproductive clinic. And so a lot of what um, I had been struggling with in terms of like talking to other gynecologists and having folks feel like you're still too young, like you don't yeah. know, right? Like I am also not someone who has a child right now. And so most doctors are not willing uh, to remove your tubes, even one of them, right? Unless you have a child. But right? other doctors will tell someone half your age who wants the child and, and, and feels ready. Oh no, it's okay. You got this. I support you. Someone yeah. literally half your age. 
Yeah. A decision that will last. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. So, and so this, I can talk about this all the time because it's, it's wild and insane, right? There are so many things that I know about pregnancy um, and about birth that people who are going to have children do not know or their doctors don't tell them, right? So right. I received lots of questions about like, well, why do you want to do it? You're so, especially after like we did the uh, transvaginal ultrasound um, and she's like, oh, your uterus is so beautiful. Why would you want to do this, right? All of these things where people are like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to do this? That is the number one question. I got the number one question, basically anyone who is doing this, unless you're very fortunate that you have a doctor who's like, absolutely, let's go. Most people are going to ask, are you sure? The whole time. Right. So I got, are you sure after I was already in the bed, (laughs) right in the the hospital, right in the gown, like the, the anesthesia, like the anesthesiologist is getting ready to, to come into the room. Right. All of that stuff. And she's like, are you sure? Right. Right. So even before that, what folks also have to recognize is like the other things that may be required as part of this process. So for me, I was already aware of, again, like pushback that, um, you know, women may get by trying to make this particular decision. And so I told my sister when she was going and, and taking a look at one, the doctors who, who are capable of performing this procedure, I said, I didn't want any doctor who was going to require a psyche valve. Mm. right like that's Mm -hmm. also a big piece there's some people who definitely want that and I Mm -hmm. absolutely I'm like if you know that you want to like go through that and fully ask yourself if this is the decision that you want to make by all means go ahead and do that for me I was just like I don't need to tell somebody again like all of these things right right? it also doesn't sound like this life-changing um like profoundly life-changing procedure it doesn't sound like it's trauma-based which I feel no would, so would make more would make the psyche valve not that it's inappropriate at any time but would make it more appropriate and emergent yes and so for me I knew like I wasn't doing this because like oh I hate this I hate this I hate this and now I'm going to do the surgery because like I hate everything I'm actually like I really enjoy my life right, right? and I, I want to continue, I, continue doing so right exactly like I would just like to live a much more free life given the decision that you know I have elected to make for my life uh and so and I picked this particular surgery one because again it's not touching the ovaries and it's not touching the uterus. It's literally just touching the cables in between them. So when I describe it to people, um, because folks are like, well, what's happening? You know, the first question I always get is like, do you still have a period? I'm like, yes. (laughs) All you're doing is cutting. Yes. Those walls still come tumbling down, okay? Exactly, like all you're doing is cutting the literal tubes. Right? So you so can still not, carry if you decide, just not exactly email. right. And so that was the biggest. That is why I made this particular decision because I knew that um, I could be pregnant at some point and may decide that I want to be pregnant, not necessarily for myself, right. but I did not want to get pregnant. So I did not want natural conception, right. and this and this particular procedure basically eradicates um natural conception right there's literally no way for an egg unless it's like i don't know just hanging out in there <laughs> right right yeah, okay okay and they right. saw, they and saw those like tools coming around like, mm, i'm gonna post that right over here exactly like right in the uterus and i'm gonna just wait for some sperm to hang out like that is the way that would have to happen which is like insane so that's why i chose this particular procedure because it's the most and i put that in air quotes because again the female body is crazy um non-hormonal right Mm -hmm. so um it is like the least because again you're not touching uh your ovaries and you're not touching your uterus they really just go in there snip snip burn the ends and that's it right like braids yeah like that's it they just chop yep if you got just some little roll braids right Right. here just chop them off And, and then that's it it's an outpatient procedure oh okay right so i left you know that same day like i went in um, maybe around like seven or eight and then by like 10 30, I was done. It's a very short procedure. Yeah. I'm a dork and watched it on YouTube. Did not you? Not my own, but I watched like oh, somebody's God. surgery being. I was about to say, did you walk out of there? Like, can I do this on Blu-ray? Well, <laughs> you already, you already talked about the fact that I get like intensely interested in everything. Yes. So, I, so I have to tell people like, it's not mine. No, there's, there's <laughs> truly like a level of scholarship to everything I've heard you or talk about or seen you type about in detail. 
Yeah, I, it's funny because people at work are like, Maxine, how do you know all of these things? It's like, I, a lot of it's curiosity, right? I yeah. get very intensely curious. And so I'm like, let me look up, let me find out, um, you know, everything or See, anything, whatever. Um, my sisters and some of my cousins just developed this new joke where we were like naming what sea animal everyone would be. And everyone's like, oh, Lexi's a seahorse because the way they just put out eggs is how she puts out information. And it's just like, you know, there you go. There this is why is. I went category, so I don't see yes. the problem. <laughs> exactly. And so overall, I've been very fortunate in that, uh, you know, recovery from the surgery has been very uneventful. Like I forget I had surgery all the time, yeah. uh, which is great and really what you want. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it is, and it's also, I got uh, laparoscopic. So again, it's like the one cut in your belly button. And then I have, um, a scar on top of each of my hips. Cause that's where they just like, right. Um, right. and then within the first five days, is where you're dealing with like soreness. And really it, it feels like if you did a really intense like core workout right? for really the first five days. Um, and then for two weeks, it's like, you take it slow, obviously, cause like you've had surgery. <laughs> so like, don't go crazy. right? And then uh, you do your post-op after two weeks and then they give you the all clear. Cause you can't have anything, like nothing goes in your vagina yeah for two weeks right they're very serious like no tampons nothing nothing is in there right so okay. if you need to feel something you better use some honey pot because work it out yeah <laughs> it's like i don't know nothing right. goes in there and then after that um you're done and what i tell people is i mean it, it also depends like how excited people are about sex but i have right. sex so and there is no refractory period. So this is not like a vasectomy where you're like, oh, we got to wait and see if it works. And da -da. Mm -hmm. it's like, there is no way to see if it works because you have removed physical things from your yeah, body. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So it's, you know, when it's time to go, it's like, yeah. I was doing this because I'm like, I don't want to have children and I'm trying to have the best possible sex life that I can have. Yeah without worrying about children, which I didn't want. So mm -hmm. that's why I think, um, for me, why I've been like so excited to talk about it, because I mm -hmm. think a lot of people will center children within the sterilization conversation when I'm like, there can be so many other reasons right. why you've decided to do that. And for me, it was like, how can I live like the best possible life? And mm -hmm. this made sense for me to, you know, be able to go ahead and do that. 